Welcome everybody to Paleo Talks, episode 14. We have Jack Singh with us today. Uh, just to introduce you a little bit more about the program before we introduce Jack. This program is coming to you from the Center of Excellence in Paleontology and the Gray Fossil Site here in Johnson City, Tennessee. So East Tennessee State University where we've built this paleontology program. And, and while a lot of us are working mostly from home, we, we started this paleo talks to keep things going in our discussions. Also with me today is David Moscato, a co-host, and he is also our science communicator. David, if you wouldn't mind just going over how we do the program quickly. Sure thing. Uh, for the people, some, a lot of our listeners have seen our paleo talks before and they know, but as a refresher, uh, we're going to go for a little while letting Jack work through the presentation. Blaine's going to ask questions and prompt while our audience sits there and enjoys it. And then about halfway through, so these days we're going longer, so that'll be me 25 minutes in or so, I'm going to chime in and remind everybody that is watching that you can ask questions. So if you're watching us here live on Facebook, you can go ahead and submit a comment next to the video or underneath the video. If for whatever reason you can't, uh, leave a comment on Facebook or you're not logged into Facebook, you can send us a question on our Twitter or on Instagram, Gray Fossil site. I'll be checking those as well to catch any questions that might be coming in outside. And then the second half will be led by questions from our audience that we will ask to our guest. Great. Thank you, David. Uh, I'm Blaine Schubert. I don't know if I've already said that or not, but I'm Blaine Schubert. And we are, we're part of the geosciences program as well here at ETSU. So, so overall, we have geosciences paleontology program, we have the Gray Fossil Site, and we have the Center of Excellence in Paleontology. And today, Dr. Jack Singh, who has just recently moved to California, is going to talk with us about some of his recent research. And so, Jack, if you wouldn't mind going ahead and showing your first screen. And what I'd like you to do too, Jack, is, is tell us a little bit more about your background and you know, where did you go to school? What led you down studying the, to, down the path of studying the animals that you're studying and so forth? Sure, Blaine. Uh, first of all, thank you to Blaine, David, and all the others at ETSU for having me. I'm very happy to be here to share you know, my story with you. Uh, I started down this path of paleontology as an undergrad uh, here at UC Berkeley, where I am now as faculty. So it really has in many ways come full circle for me. Uh, but at the time, I was involved as a volunteer in, in one of the research labs, picking through under a microscope, uh, tiny uh, rocks and, and sand looking for small bones. So, so these are called microfossils. Uh, and that's how I got started. And amazingly, though, that didn't turning off of paleo because that's a, oftentimes if you have done it a long and arduous process of looking for tiny bones and teeth in a pile of sand. Uh, but from there I went to graduate school uh, at the University of Southern California where I studied uh, under Xiaoming Wang uh, of the Los Angeles Natural History Museum and, and that's how I, I really got interested in carnivorans and, and all their, their powerful extinct relatives. And from there, then I, I went, moved across the country and, and did my postdoctoral studies at the American Museum of Natural History uh, with Dr. John Flynn. And we continued you know, our, our carnivorous research, but that's where I actually you know, began to, to look further back in time at the, the origins of the carnivora. Uh, so really, you know, my interest in carnivorous spans the entire evolutionary history of that group, uh, as well as you know, their functional morphology. Uh, and, and before I, I came to Berkeley a month ago, I was a faculty member at the University of Buffalo where I taught human growth anatomy and, and continue my paleo research. So, so that's sort of <laughs> where I came from and where I am now. Jack, I remember the first time that I heard about some of your work. It was some people that came running down and saying they were so excited about a video that you had shown or some work that you were doing on hyenas eating bone. Yes, well, yes, that, that's right. Was that, yeah. was that part of your PhD? Yes, so, so as part of my, my PhD research, uh, I went to, I came back to Berkeley, actually as a PhD student, to observe some of the spotted hyenas that were living in Berkeley. So I didn't have to go to Africa, 
Berkeley had their own uh, captive spotted hyena colony um, that, that was uh, started by uh, a few biologists uh, who were interested in observing and studying the behavior of spotted hyenas. But I, I just was interested in, in how they were able to eat bone because they do this in nature and, and they continue to be fed a, a bone heavy diet at Berkeley. Uh, so one of the videos, I, I'm pretty sure this is what you're talking about, you know, is, is um, a, a breakfast session you know, at the colony with uh, some of the animals you know, being fed you know, entire chunks of bone with, with meat and bone all mixing together. So it's just a portion of a pig's neck and, and the hyena is just crunching right through it you know, with no hesitation. So that's, you know, that's what really continues to inspire me to study Perfect. these animals, you know, living and extinct because you know, how, how, <laughs> it's hard to fathom how they're able to do that when you know, they're not made of, they're not like Iron Man, they're not made of iron and steel, they're made of the same bone that they're eating. So that's, that's sort of the beauty of the biomechanics of how they can do that with the same material. How serendipitous that Berkeley happens to have its very own hyenas. I mean, that's not something that we usually hear that a university has. Yes, that's right. So, <laughs> so it was all, you know, <laughs> all very lucky for me you know, to be able to to experience these. And, and I think that's just so important, you know, for, for students learning to, to experience firsthand, whether it's looking for fossils or observing animals, because that that's, you know, stays with you. you know, it's, yeah. Sometimes I dream about hyenas. Uh, I don't know if that's normal, but, but I do. And, <laughs> and it drives my research. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, why don't you go ahead and, and start working our way through your presentation? Sure, great, uh, I'll get started. And again, thank you all out there in, Facebook and internet world for joining us. I'm happy here to, to talk to you about a tale of two Miocene amphibious shell crushers. And one of the things I want to highlight that's gonna be part of our, our story, our journey here today, uh, is the fact that uh, functional morphology or, or the study of anatomical and morphological features to infer or to reconstruct their function has a long history in paleontology. So in a way, all paleontologists are also functional morphologists to, to some level. Uh, and that's because you know, when most of us find fossils, you know, of course we're happy and excited to find a new fossil, but we almost immediately you know, then think about what was this animal like in life? How large was the animal? What were they eating? How did they interact with other species? And, and that really drives a lot of people to continue to look for new fossils and find new ways to interpret their lifestyles. So that's sort of the, the basis for, for what we're talking about here today. But at the same time, now when we talk about functional morphology and, and somebody shows you a title like this, you know, one of the things that's very critical for you to assess for those of us still living in a, a fact-based world is that how do we know what we know? And, and today, you know, I'm going to focus the story on only one aspect of that title, but I want to show you that this way of storytelling about extinct life really is a, a continuous process over generations and across multiple labs and, and researchers. Researchers who found out about the age of these animals through the study of geology and, and other animals that occur in the area. Researchers that study the sediments and, and other animals that are not the shell crushers, but the, the, the organisms they lived with and figured out you know, this was a, an environment between uh, the interface between water and land. And of course, you know, the shell crushers can't function without shells uh, if they're gonna you know, have the capability to crush them. But really our story today will focus on how we know or how, why I'm interpreting the two fossil uh, critters that we will mentioned as crushers. And this is through the study of biomechanics. Studying the, the complexity and the evolutionary history of you know, different morphological features, it's a little bit like shopping on Amazon. So, so these are images I grabbed off of the internet. You know, I just Googled, uh, show me some, some nutcrackers. So, so some human tools for cracking through hard foods. And this is you know, a small sample of what you get. You know, you might have tools that are multi-purpose. So in this case, you now you can use this tool in the upper left-hand corner to eat nuts, to eat invertebrates, you know, hard-shelled invertebrates. Or you can have a more specialized tool like this one that's really most useful for a, a single food item and a single size at that. 
And you can have other tools that might seem a little bit overkill for what you want to do, but maybe it's also good for other things. So this is analogous or similar to what we find when we look at both the modern biodiversity and the fossil record. What we see is a range of morphological features that at first might seem overwhelming. It's like, how do we make sense of why animals are different? Does it actually mean anything? And, and on top of that, you know, just like what you see on the screen here, nature has a habit of generating multiple solutions, functional solutions to similar problems. So that makes the study of functional morphology more exciting, but at the same time, more challenging. So we start our story with a, a modern carnivoran, so a, a member of the mammalian group Carnivora. And this is the sea otter. And what I will show you is a part of a clip that shows how sea otters are able to eat and crack through hard foods with tool, but not necessarily with your mouth. So what you can see here is an otter on its back with a rock that it's gonna use to smash a large mollusk and get their food that way. And these sea otters, although they can use tools for these larger ones, they also uh, directly crush smaller invertebrates with their mouth. So that's sort of the, the, the model organism that we're going to be discussing these fossils in the context of. So think about those sea otters and, and that's now go back 20 million years at the beginning of the Miocene. One of the creatures, one of the main characters in our story today is a, a bear sized and a potential bear relative called Coponomos newportensis. Uh, and this has been lovingly dubbed the beach bear uh, by other researchers and, and some reporters when this story came out. Uh, but, but this critter, Coponomus, lived in what's today the Pacific Northwest uh, in the areas of Oregon and Washington. And, and there's about a handful of fossils known, mostly from the, the skull region of this animal. And they've been found in coastal deposits so what we think of as, you know, a paradise for, for paleo seafood lovers, all sorts of shelled invertebrates preserved in the area. And, and this critter also tend, uh, had uh, some very interesting skull morphology, skull characteristics that we will take a deeper look at later. Before we get to that, I want to first introduce the second character that we'll talk about today. Uh, and this is what I, lovingly called the huge otter. This is, was a, a giant otter that, that lived deep in the forest of Southeast Asia about 6 million years ago. So this is about 14 to 15 million years after the time of Coponomus. And this is in Asia, not the Pacific Northwest. So they, they lived in different times in different places, but they were both pretty big. So this one was not quite bear size, but a, a has been estimated to, to be around the size of a modern gray wolf. So if you can imagine that, you know, hiking around in the, the freshwater you know, lakes and creeks today in North America and seeing an otter, a river otter, the size of a wolf, uh, it's probably exciting and scary at the same time. Uh, but, but this animal you know, lived six million years ago, no longer today. So, so we don't have behavior from them, but we know that they are part of the group uh, that we call otters. And these two animals have captured the fascination, the imagination of paleontologists ever since they were discovered. Coponomos on the right hand side was uh, discovered in the 70s, but, but this particular species was formally described in 1994 by Dick Tefford and, and colleagues. And they suggested at the time that this was a ursid or a bear variation on a sea otter adaptation. So they thought that Coponomus uh, not necessarily used tools like the modern sea otters do, but in terms of their jaw strength, they were able to crush those jaws directly with, uh, cr crush those shells directly with their jaws. On the other hand, uh, this huge otter, Siamal galley, which was discovered much more recently, about 10 years ago, was hypothesized by, by some of my uh, colleagues and myself as another example of a sea otter-like uh, critter. 
Yes. If I ask a question, are mm -hmm. these found alongside of broken shells? The uh, yes, they are. Uh, but the, the tricky part is, no, we, we don't have direct evidence that those shells were broken by those animals. They could have been broken you know, from the process of preservation. So no, there is not a direct evidence. No, there, there's no shell no, next to the mouth of the animal and, and, and it's exactly not a, showing. Or maybe nobody's looked at a particular type of pattern that you might get of shell breakage. I, that's one of, so the, one of the, my conclusion or the take home messages is for somebody to maybe look in, in more depth at you know, those shell breakage patterns. Because we do know that uh, modern sea otters can create these characteristic breakage patterns that right. form archeological records. You now you have these shell mounds in the Pacific you know, coast paralleling between you know, the Native Americans creating these shell mounds, you know, right out here in the Berkeley Bay area. We have the Ohlone uh, tribe creating these shell mounds from, from their uh, hunting sites. The sea otters did the same thing you know, back in the Pleistocene. And so there, we do know a lot more about these sea otters, but then, you know, Nobody has taken that context and said, let's look at these two fossil sites and see if we can identify similar patterns. But it's oh, interesting. It, I mean, because you, you may end up finding some kind of impressions that actually go that coincide with cusps. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Uh, especially, you know, because the, the dental morphology in these two critters have the, definitely a lot of superficial similarities to sea otters. So you would expect, you know, similar you know, breakage mm -hmm. patterns in that case. Yeah, so it's a very great. Uh, so that really is the central question is, were, were these sea otters of their time? You know, was, was the beach bear, a, a, a beach otter bear, and was the Samuel Galley, you know, the, the hulk that was able to crush these like a sea otter? So, so that's what we're going to get into today you know, with a very <laughs> curious sea otter in the middle. Before we get to how we find out and how we answer this question about whether they were sea otter like, let's take a look at the, the fossils and the morphology. And on the left here, you see a, a lower jaw of the beach bear. Uh, there are additional fossil materials, but because you know, the, the lower jaws were the most complete ones preserved, we were only able to, to use the lower jaws in our analyses. So we, we have not done a cranial or any uh, post-cranial, so limb-based analyses to, to more completely describe their lifestyle, but we're focusing on jaws, lower jaws today. And, and just from a superficial examination, you know, I've scaled these to a similar jaw length because otherwise the, the sea otter would be minuscule compared to the, the beach bear. But you can see that both animals have more or less sort of bunodont or rounded cusp crown shapes. Uh, those of Coponomos, the beach bear, are much more worn. So we actually don't know a whole lot about whether the, the intact state of the teeth are like sea otters and that they have these round uh, and, and low-lying smooth uh, cusps. So superficially, they might resemble each other, but there are also some very interesting differences. And, and one thing I would point out that will become important later on is the fact that the chin of the beach bear is at a different orientation compared to the sea otter. Uh, sea otter is, is typical of you know, otter kind and, and weasel kind in that the, the joint between the two sides of the, the mandible called the mandibular symphysis is more or less inclined at a, an angle, you know, pointing towards the front of the mouth. Whereas in Coponomos, the beach bear, there's a more vertical orientation. And, and it's not shown here, but if you actually look at the joint where the two sides of the mandible meet, there's a lot more you know, small bony protrusions, essentially you know, more interlocking in the beach bear jaw compared to the sea otter jaw. So, so that keep that in mind, that's gonna become important. And Jack, did I understand correctly that we don't have any unworn teeth um, they're all pretty worn, so we don't actually know the cusp morphology of, of the beach bear. That's correct, yeah. Some of the premolars on here are less worn, so those are, are similar in crown height to the sea otter, but we don't know as much about molars because they're very worn. Uh, and, and the where we presume, uh, nobody has actually done a, a microscopic study, but we presume this is from eating whatever they were eating, shells or other you know, prey items. Uh, because we see that both in, in the lower jaw and the upper teeth. So they seem to have been using them to, to grind something. And then you just brought up uh, another question that I had, and that is whether or not anybody's done microware on either of these animals yet. No, no, they, they, they have not. Uh, there are three specimens known from, mm. from the, this beach bear. 
there's one right here in the UCMP. So, so maybe this is a potential project for somebody you know, to come in and visit us and study this. There's one in LA and the, the specimen that we actually study is a Smithsonian specimen. Uh, but all three are from the Pacific Northwest. They're just housed in different museums. But, but no, no, as far as I know, nobody has molded these teeth, cast them and did any microwave analysis on them. A future project. Yes, definitely. So now if we you know, take a deeper look into uh, Tedford and, and colleagues 1994 paper on Coponomus Nipotensis, they actually formulated you know, quite nicely a hypothesis already. So it's easy for, for somebody like me to come along and say, now let's test this with some uh, quantitative techniques. So this is what I call Tedford's twist hypothesis. Now, it sounds like a dance, but it's, it's not. It's, it's a hypothesis about how Coponomus may have used its, its jaw and, and this is a graphic that we generated in our study. And essentially what Tepper hypothesized was that coponomus with its very vertically oriented relative to the length of the jaw and deep mandibular symphysis used its front part of the jaw like a pry bar or a crowbar. since so you would dive to, to the depth you know, under the sea and, and dislodge these invertebrates by closing their mouth around a particular shelled organism and then twisting their head, essentially moving their neck to pry these shells off. And then they will use their you know, large and, and very robust teeth to crack them you know, once that's uh, dislodged from uh, the substrate. So, so this sequence is, uh, can be translated into a mechanical problem. So, so one part of it, you know, the hunting part, the food acquisition part, is a prying motion. So there's torque being generated by this jaw or experienced by this jaw. And then the actual crushing you know, the mastication, the chewing part is also you know, the forces are generated by, by jaw muscles on the animal. So both of these, given that they're, they're biomechanical scenarios can be directly tested you know, with the method that I, I'm gonna show you next. Okay, so, so in order to get some answers to the question of whether coponomos was prying shells uh, as shown in the previous slide and or were they crushing the, the shells just like the modern sea otters might do to a, a smaller shell, we turn to something called finite element simulation or finite element analysis. Uh, this is a method that was uh, conceived half a century ago by engineers and at the time they, they created this method to try to uh, speed up the process of testing uh, deformation or, or stress and strain on, on some sort of engineered item without having to build prototype, physical prototypes and then testing them and then essentially doing this whole cycle of research and development. They were speeding that up with mathematical calculations. So we, we sort of biologists you know, took advantage of that and say, well, we can do the same thing. You know, we, we cannot go and, and recreate a coponomus uh, we can't clone them because they're, they're long extinct and their bones are, are fossilized, mineralized to, to the point where it's, it doesn't have the properties of real you know, modern bone. But we can still use a model approach to, to get at you know, how likely you know, was their jaw morphology to allow that kind of behavior to happen. So the key word here is we, we're, we're analyzing capability. You know, we can't use this method to say they definitely did this and they definitely did not do that, but we can at least get a bound a boundary on what kind of capability they have. So that's really the, the main uh, advantage of applying this method into these questions about morphology. Okay, so basically you take a fossil or a modern skull, put it through a CAT scan, and through a series of you know, cleaning and, and meshing and modeling, uh, not unlike you know, some of the 3D printing protocols that some of you might be you know, playing around with at home, uh, but this is all virtual. So at the end, we got a 3D model that we continue to test in the computer by applying realistic bone properties and muscle forces essentially to bring this animal back to life on the computer. So we're jumping right to the results and we want to, to see uh, whether Coponomus, the beach bear, was like an otter. On the screen here, you see three columns of images and, and one of the advantages of finite element simulation is that they can be very easily visualized in the form of heat maps. So if you look at the leftmost column here, 
know, we have a series of different species. The two otters we analyze are down here, and they have these hot spots uh, in, in the front part of the jaw here. That shows, uh, in this case, this is a, a pry bar scenario where we have subjected all these species to, to the prying motion. The hot spots on the sea otters and the, the river otters show that you know, these were not very great when they were being used to pry. The jaw up here from a panthera, from a leopard, also is not very great. Uh, and, and these make sense because these animals don't do that very much. Uh, whereas some other animals like uh, bear and wolf, uh, they don't do it, a lot of prying, but they do incorporate some tough or, or hard foods in their diets. So, so it, it is consistent with you know, a harder diet uh, for, for some of these larger animals. But yeah, let's focus, anybody, yes. Has anybody done any studies where they're actually testing uh, some of these hot spots with real specimens to see whether or not that's where they fail first? Uh, yes. So for carnivores, the only lab that I know of that's doing this is uh, our own lab. <laughs> we, we have moved from virtuality to reality. <laughs> so we are... I remember you telling me that you were, you know, asking people if you could destroy their bones. Yes, that's right. Yeah. Yeah. So as it's understandable, we didn't get many takers <laughs> because they didn't <laughs> want us decimating their museum collections. So, so we have been testing uh, a range of easily accessible uh, commercial specimens of North American carnivores. Uh, and yes, we are literally placing these real jaws under uh, mechanical testing machines and we are crushing them. And we are at the same time recording them with uh, high-speed camera systems to see exactly where those hotspots are. So yeah, that's right. We're doing this exactly, you know, and replicate it in a, a real world setting. Uh, and that's one of the most exciting parts about this is who doesn't want to see things <laughs> crushed and, and blown up? I mean, there, there is a, you know, we were thinking about maybe eventually having a YouTube channel. Maybe this is the thing we can get votes on this. Because I, I saw that there is a hydraulic press channel where somebody would just you know, take anything and just <laughs> destroy them in a hydraulic press. Well, we're going to do this in a more scientific way. You know, we're actually collecting data and, and trying to interpret you know, bone strength. But that's exactly what we're hoping to do. And that, I think, is what's needed. No, and, and you could put out a call to people all over the world and say, send me your jaw and then I'll crush it online. Yeah, if you want to see your jaw, not your own jaw, but if you want to see a specimen <laughs> crushed, uh, let us know, send us some bones and we can crush it. So, so yes, yeah, we we're doing you know, a lot of that now and we're starting with the smaller ones because you know, it, it does, the larger specimens are, are more difficult to get. Uh, but we are working towards uh, bear size and we're working on bear jaws now. Uh, so. Stay tuned for, for no, more new data to come in, in the future. All right. I might have a few bear jaws for you. All right. Awesome. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Jack, while, while you're finishing up this, uh, first of all, absolutely, I vote for that YouTube channel. Please do that. I would subscribe <laughs> immediately. Uh, and we've already all, already got a couple people, uh, several people <laughs> in, the, in the Facebook comments saying, yes, please do that. Uh, and speaking of which, I'm going to take this opportunity to remind all of our people watching uh, that we're going to start taking questions. So Jack, I'll let you finish what you're uh, discussing here on this slide while our viewers type in and submit their questions. And then here in just a little bit, let's start working through some of those. Sure. Sounds good. So, so we're continuing with our slide here. Uh, on the right column, we have simulations from biting. So the left column is prying, you know, getting those shells off of the ground and then crushing them with their teeth. And one of the things that you notice is in either case, you know, coponomas, the beach here, and also in this case, you know, the smilodon, I'll explain a little bit later, are not behaving like the otter at all. So we, we found this unexpected, but there's sort a of, you know, logical similarity in that you know, if we dig into the saber tooth literature, and then you might be asking, why, why is he talking about saber tooth now? It's not just because, now, if you include a saber tooth, you can pretty much publish any paper in, in carnivore biology, people love saber tooth. But it's also because the saber tooth literature has spoken a lot about this very deep and vertical mandibular symphysis that's thought to serve as an anchor for saber tooth such as smilodon with which to drive their upper teeth into the prey. So the lower jaw is a stabilizer, supposedly, to allow uh, that movement from the upper jaw. 
in the case of the beach bear, you know, it didn't have saber teeth, uh, but we, we thought that you know, maybe that the prying would have required similar strength and lower jaw, and that is actually what we found. So before you know, we start to talk a little bit more about this in general, your questions, uh, I wanna show you a similar study that we did now on this huge otter, uh, this giant otter from Southeast Asia. And again, these are comparisons of the lower jaw on the left of the huge otter, on the right, the sea otter. In this case, uh, there is a lot more similarity in the overall shape of the jaw and also some of the teeth that are present uh, because you know, these are both true otters. So what we see here, the same kind of result. Uh, in this case, we compare the giant otter, the, the huge otter with almost all the living species of otters. And here, just showing a couple of examples, you can see that those hot spots you know, they pop up essentially in every living otter jaw when we did a simulation, but not in the fossil otter. So then that, we're scratching our heads thinking, you know, why would that be? Is it just because they are gigantic and therefore they can handle more forces? We actually looked under the hood at the number, so we're gonna get into a little bit more of a numerical data here, but I'm going to try to simplify it with these icons. Uh, we're gonna talk about mechanical efficiency which you can think of as sort of like a fuel efficiency. You know, how much gasoline you put in, how much mileage you get out. In this case, it's your input muscle force and output bite force. The stiffness of the jaw, which is how much deformation, how much energy goes into deforming the jaw versus uh, deforming or cracking whatever food item in the mouth is in the mouth. And then the size of the animal, which we think might be an explanation for why the giant otter was able to handle uh, such stress. So taking the fuel with the mechanical efficiency on the horizontal axis and the stiffness in the vertical axis, and you should note that stiffness here, these values uh, are in sort of uh, inversely proportional to stiffness. The higher the value, the lower the stiffness, because these values mean the energy that's created during biting is going into the jaw and not into the food. So you're wasting that energy and you're instead you know, bending your own jaw. And what we see, if we plot all the different otters on here, they're color-coded by their general diets and the circles represent the relative body sizes. What we see is that it, the, the giant otter is, is really utterly unimpressive you know, given their size. They're, they're simply following the same trend as all of the other otters. So that might be a little bit disappointing. You know, we, 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 we want the giant otter to be this superhero, but in this case, it is not. Uh, in fact, the, the weirdo here is another otter that we can talk about later if we want, but this is a modern South Asian smooth-coated otter that seems to have very high stiffness, low strategy values for whatever reason. So being very unsatisfied with our first you know, comparison there, we then looked at size. You know, maybe size could, could help us explain. And, and in this case, we're comparing size on the horizontal with stiffness on the vertical. So again, higher, uh, higher string energy values indicate lower stiffness. And what we see is that, again, there is, seems to be a relationship between larger animals and, and higher energy or lower stiffness. So, so this actually, again, might seem to, to tell us that, okay, there is some sort of a relationship that's common across all animals. But there is a twist because I haven't included the giant otter or the beach bear on here. So if we plot those on here, we see that you know, compared to everybody else that we study, the giant otter here and the beach bear here, they both fall and also smile on the saber tooth. They all fall be beneath this line. What does this mean? That means for their size, for the size of Samuel Galley, what you expect is a much higher string energy or, or a much lower stiffness than what you actually see. So this actually tells us these two animals, even though they're in many ways not very otter-like, both have exceptional stiffness in the jaw given their size. So it's not just their size, but it's also the stiffness of their jaw. And we might talk about you know, different reasons for why that is. Okay, so to some wrap up before we get into the question and, and answering sessions, 
based on those simulations, you know, we are concluding, and this is not the final story, I would say, you know, there are much more that you can do, like what Blaine and I were talking about, you know, microwave analyses or, or uh, taphonomic analyses on damage on the shells that may have co-occurred with these animals. But at least based on our analysis of the jaw, we can say that Coponomos, the beach bear, and Siamogali, the giant otter, were eaters like no otter. And, and this might come as a surprise, and this actually essentially rejects both of those hypotheses that we posed near the beginning of this presentation. But the story continues. You know, how, if they were not otter-like, what exactly were they like? What, are there living analogs that we can use to better understand these animals? And if not, if they're totally unique, what does that mean for the type of paleoecological communities? You know, what does it mean for the, the world of the past that are no longer here that may have been very, very different from it? And what we see in those areas today. So all those remain very fascinating questions for paleontologists. Uh, and that's it for now. Uh, again, I'd like to thank you know, the organizers, Lang and, and David and others for inviting me. Mauricio Anton, which you, you, I think you have heard from, uh, for his wonderful artwork and all the collaborators that, that you know, got the fossils and, and got the CT scans and, and got us going in these research projects. And I think we're ready for, for some discussion. Thank you. All right, David, do we have any questions coming in? We sure do. Thanks a lot for that, Jack. And just as another reminder, everybody, if you have questions, you can put them in our comments thread on our Facebook video. Or if you can't leave a comment on Facebook, head over to the Gray Fossil site Twitter or Instagram and I'll send us a question there and I'll be checking it. So let's see. We've got a bunch of questions that have come in already. Uh, Grant, hi, Grant asked, has any isotopic work been done on either of these taxa? A uh, great question. The answer is no, uh, because we have so few specimens. Uh, we have not, I, I don't know if people have asked, but we definitely have not uh, tried to request permission to sample these. Uh, I think right now those collections are reluctant to let us sample anything other than, than doing non-destructive research because they're so rare. Jack, I have a follow-up on that actual question, and that's whether or not now that you're in the region again, whether you want to try and hit those localities to find more. Uh, yes, that's definitely a possibility. Uh, these two locations, so, so the Washington locality is the Clotum Formation, uh, and it's, it's pretty accessible, and the Oregon locality are in the, the Nine Mudstone, and there are many other specimens that come from the Nine Mudstone. The, the collecting is a little bit different. So the Nine Mudstone, you know, it's, it's more of a a uh, prospecting where you're walking along and looking for these you know, very weathered, polished you know, uh, boulders uh, that contain these. So, so many of these specimens are gonna be asset prep. Uh, we do have facilities here in the UCMP for that. Uh, whereas the, the Washington locality might require a bit more of a ex excavation style of collecting. But yes, no, those are not too far from me. And, and I don't know if uh, the folks up there are, are still going back, but I'm definitely interested in, in you know, getting in touch and see if you know, anybody's still going there. Yeah, and it'll be fun I mean, to find more, even if it's fragmentary, maybe we can use those fragments to, to do you know, isotopic analysis or microwear on them. All right, we have another question. Speaking of microwear, uh, Melissa asked a question. Hi, Melissa, about mesoware. Uh, does the mesoware you see compare to that of sea otters? Yes, in a way, we do see that. Uh, so typically when you look at sea otter teeth, and especially ones that are, are from older individuals, they form, uh, the cusps form these, what I would call, they're not exactly the same as in, in herbivores, but these enamel lakes or dentin lakes. So they worn down the cusp and they start to form these uh, large uh, exposed ridges of the enamel. What we see in uh, Samogali and Coponomas is uh, a more exaggerated you know, state of what you see in, typically in, in sea otters. So essentially, if you take a sea otter and then you just grind it down with sandpaper for, for weeks or months, that's what you get in Coponomas. And that's actually you know, a very fascinating difference. And, and I think you know, if you think back to the video that we showed with the sea otter just using you know, the, the rock and, and smashing the clam on top of it. Most of the, the toughest parts or the hardest parts of the sea otter diet is done using those tools and not using their mouth. 
So, so I think that's related to the fact that sea otters do not have an extreme of a tooth wear. Uh, and that's what we actually use in our papers to argue that these fossil critters did not have the ability to use tools other than their mouth. And that's why even with the, 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 hardest, the hardest, the largest shells, they still have to use their mouth. And that's why they're you know, getting those very extreme wear that you don't see in a sea otter. Interesting. Um, speaking of other uh, creatures with other habits, Aaron asks, another one of our graduates, hi Aaron, were walruses contemporaneous with beach bears? Uh, did they gradually replace them or did they show up after they went extinct? I'm curious to know if there's competitive exclusion at play. Mm, very good question. Uh, I think that is possible, but at least at the sites where we have coponomos, uh, there are no very unambiguous you know, evidence of walruses in the area. Uh, but I do think, I, I don't know, honestly, I don't know the walrus fossil record very well. Uh, I, I stick on the terrestrial side. So this beach or, or uh, riparian, you know, creek side animals are as aquatic as I have gotten. Uh, so you know, I would say that the, I know there are Miocene walrus relatives, not the modern species, but they're, they're very extinct and very strange, you know, wonderfully weird you know, walruses with you know, saber tooth and, and you know, teeth going in different directions. Uh, but we don't have direct evidence uh, at the site. Uh, and in addition, you know, from what we know about modern walruses, the, the way that they feed uh, would have been somewhat different. If they fed on the same animals, they would have been in, in still in direct competition. But walruses uh, use suction to, to suck those, the soft parts of the shelled mollusks out of the shells. So walruses do not have to crush. Uh, they probably could if they wanted to because they're, they're giant, they're much larger than you know, the beach bear. Uh, but they've adopted, adapted to, to a suction feeding mode where essentially you're bypassing the hard shell and just using a, a, a biological vacuum cleaner to get those soft parts out. Uh, so that's a great question. I think you know, it, it's worth looking into. You know, I, I don't know much about the walrus record um, for the rest of the Miocene, but they're definitely around. They're, they're relatively abundant. Jack, we have a question from Sharon Holty, another one of our past students who's a curator up at the Mammoth site now. And she asks about the dental formula of, of, of one versus the other. And so, you know, when, when you have one that's more bear-like, are they still using the same teeth in the same way? Or are they using different teeth in crushing? Yeah, and great question. So if I can go back, let's talk while we're looking at some of the, the jaw. So talking about the, the huge otter first. So the, the otter dental formula is very similar. We're missing a bunch of teeth here in the fossil. Uh, essentially you have the, the largest tooth here, the lower molar is the, the main crushing tooth. And then uh, as you can see on here, you know, there is a second molar that's missing, but it was there. It's just an empty root, uh, empty uh, alveolus there. And, and pretty much the same number of premolars, you know, two premolars in the front and then a very tiny one just behind the canine. So the, the otter, giant otter is very similar to the sea otter. If you look at coponomos, you can see that, you know, first we'll compare it to, to sort of the superficially similar sea otter. Uh, the first molar of coponomos is also very large, but the, the second molar of coponomos is actually better developed than in the sea otter. So there, there's a lot more, maybe almost relatively speaking, you know, twice the, the relative area, because this is a narrow, much narrower tooth. Uh, in terms of a beach bear compared to a, a true bear, a modern ursid, uh, the, the dental formula is more or less the same, because you, you get a, what we think of as a sort of a, a more ancestral condition where you have lots of premolars, and then you have almost a full arrangement of molars. There might be even a tiny vestigial molar three here. Yeah, that's what I was wondering is if I was seeing a little uh, little vestigial three there. Yeah, I believe that's, that's how modern, we interpreted it. Modern bears all have a third. Yep. So, so that's four premolars and three molars. That's sort of the maximum you can get right, for, mm -hmm. for this group of animals. So in terms of the dental count, no, they're definitely very similar to bears. Uh, one of the things that I, I decided to, to take out of the talk is there's actually quite a lot bit of controversy in terms of where the speech bear fits in the evolutionary you know, context of carnivorans. Uh, people have 
at times call them procyonids, so relatives of raccoons, which doesn't seem, you know, I don't see a lot of similarities there. Uh, people have called them just indeterminate carnivorans. Now they're just somewhere, they're on a the tree, but we don't know. And, and the most recent, and I'm not saying it's the correct one, but the Teffer et al. 1994 hypothesis uh, calls them erstoid. So they are, they're somewhere close to, closer to, to bears than they are to other caniform carnivorans. That doesn't say much about exactly where they fall. And, mm -hmm. and I think the dental formula is more of a, a common ancestral feature than anything that would, you know, unambiguously unite this beach bear with true bears. Uh, so that's a, yet another unanswered question where I think we just need more material uh, to, to essentially have more morphological characteristics. To yeah, we need the cusp morphology. Yes, yeah. So in reference to uh, the earlier question, uh, Darcy has offered in the comments that the first fossil walruses show up a couple million years later than Culpanomos. So in that case, uh, perhaps they didn't overlap. Thanks, Darcy. Great. Thank you, Darcy. And then we have a question here from Stephanie, who asks, is there any evidence of ontogenetic change that occurs in the diet or food sources of the giant otter or the beach bear compared to the modern otter? And as a follow-up, is this reflected in the skull morphology of juveniles compared to adults? Great question and a very important one uh, that is still very limited by you know, what materials we have. So as far as I know, there have been no identified juvenile material of uh, either the beach bear, Copanomos, or, or Samangali, the giant otter. And, and you no, know, basically we don't know, but I do want to offer some some more context because uh, in both of these cases, uh, the the geology, essentially the deposition of both of these areas, uh, on on the one hand, there does seem to be a, a relatively high energy environment for the coponomals, so so that might bias against preserving more delicate juvenile material. There's a lot of weathering uh, on the fossils you know, from the, the sites in Oregon and Washington. On the other hand, for the giant otter locality, uh, it is preserved in what is thought to be a, a bog or a swamp, a paleo swamp. Uh, today it's a lignite mine. So, so paleontologists are digging these out of a, a coal mine and it's very, very wet. When they come uh, discover material, essentially the matrix is stronger than a fossil itself. So that, that's always a tough situation where you, know, you want to preserve the fossil, but you, you also have to get rid of the matrix around it. So in many cases, uh, if you can see behind me in my background here, you know, th this is the, the skull. This is the, the upper jaw of Samogali, the giant otter. And you can see that it's broken into more than 100 pieces. Uh, this was the best possible way to collect these specimens from the Ligand mine because they just fall apart you know, from drying when you take them out of that you know, wet environment in, in the coal mine. Uh, so because of that, I think, you know, unless somebody is really specifically looking for juveniles, it, we might be missing them because, you no, know, these conditions are not conductive, con conducive to having very nice juvenile material. So that's a long way of saying, I don't know, but <laughs> I think, you no, know, if we pay attention, you no, know, if this is the question we're thinking about, and when we go to those sites, we might be thinking, let's Let's pay more attention to, to these more fragile materials and see if we can find juveniles. All right, we have a question uh, from Anthony who's asking about uh, the beach bear, it sounds like. And do you think, or how do you think they evolved between uh, freshwater and saltwater environments? Based on what we know, you know, about the, and we're really, it, it's difficult <laughs> to say we're interpreting the lifestyle of this extinct animal, mostly from its skull. So, so you know, we can make up some stories about how it moved, <laughs> not, not so much from the skull, but we, we do know that, you know, they look, based on the skull, they look very little like what we know as bears today. Uh, some of the features in the back of the skull, you know, with bony protrusions, the mastoid process coming out off of the back, you know, that are very well developed, much more developed than modern bears, you know, indicate that their neck was very strong. 
uh, and and what does that mean for for how they lived? You know, they maybe they, they could have used their neck for foraging on land. I mean, we just don't know. But but you know, based on what they were found with, you know, the shell crushing is that the working hypothesis. Whether they were fully you know capable of walking around, there are some some uh, toe bones, uh, podio bones uh, that are known from Coponomos, and they don't seem particularly specialized or derived. Uh, in the sense that you might see in a, a seal, you know, that's occupying a beach or, or a sea lion or an animal like that, and which is in a different group. You know, these are pinniped, not bears. Uh, so, so our current understanding, based on very limited, you know, post cranial material, is that you know, as far as we know, uh, this bear was you know, still pretty terrestrial. You know, it's not like they they were they have you know, flippers. You know, at least based on the toe bones. <laughs> Um, on the note of feeding habits, earlier on in the discussion, Greg McDonald uh, posited, what about scooping up bivalves from loose sediments rather than prying away from rocks that they're attached to? Yes, so I think I agree with Greg. That's definitely, no. if you if you can have an easier life, you know, why, why not make it hard for yourself? And I think, you know, we see that in modern animals, you know, they're opportunistic feeders in most cases. So yes, you know, when, when there are opportunities to do that, there's really no sense to, to do, unless, I mean, they're having fun doing it, but that's, that's something that we're <laughs> speculating about. Uh, but in this case, you no, know, again, it's the capability that, that you know, I have was studying here. So, you know, this very strong job would not have than necessary to scoop up those loose, loosely you know, anchored animals. Uh, but it's still curious, you know, why, you know, if it was abundant enough for them to just pick things off of the, the shadow you know, sea bottom, uh, you know, what would explain some of these features that, that, that indicate you know, a much stronger, much stiffer jaw mechanically? Uh, and this re actually gets into the core of you know, how the, the philosophies of functional morphology is you know, should we or do we need to to prescribe a, an adaptive function to all of the weird features we see? You know, is it do they have to have evolved or derived from from some need? Well, perhaps you no. Know, yes, but but are we studying the right you know, inferred functions? You now maybe they're using this for something else. Maybe they're displaying it. You know, look at my sexy chin. You know, they're displaying it to other animals and not really using them to pry. We really can't know at this point, but at least based on our, our hypothesis, no, it's whatever we hypothesize, the, the mechanics of it are consistent. Uh, but that's not to say they didn't you know, make their lives easier. You know, if they just had, even though scavenging off of you know, dead animals you know, along the beach or, or further inland, you know, I think based on, on their teeth and what we understand about carnivores, modern carnivores and their teeth, I don't think given their size, they would have had trouble eating most of what they find. Could they have been crushing bone? Possibly, yeah. I, I think that would be, you know, that's that's my bias. I, I would have loved to sort of pose the hypothesis, but but I can't, <laughs> can't really falsify. I have no evidence. No, we, we have lots of shells and, and we have fewer bones and, and we don't, as far as I know, we don't have cracked bones in the area. Mm -hmm. So we're more likely to find the cracked shells before we find the cracked bones, I think. Along the, that same line of discussion, in terms of what they're eating, Melissa has also asked, uh, are the taxa in the invertebrate fauna encrusting species or the kind that attach themselves to surfaces? The good question. So the answer is both. Uh, let's see, what did I, I think there's a muscle here. So that's one example where uh, the modern muscles, at least, you, know, you can find them attaching. And there are some other ones, some of these, uh, what they're called here. Uh, but there are some species that do tend to, to just, you know, at least in the modern representatives, do tend to encrust. So I think there, there's a variety of invertebrates. So you, you could find them in a loose sand, and you could probably find some species attached to you know, in the in intertidal zone as well. So it's a great question. And I think that's one of the, really, the, the, the most important next steps is to make that connection because you know I'm a vertebrate paleontologist, but the more I think about this and the, the, the more I think about it and the kind of story it tells, the more I think I need to go into the invertebrates and understand them. Uh, I, I 
hate to admit it, but I think <laughs> we want to study more invertebrates, which is fine. No, <laughs> and we have invertebrate paleontologists here, you know, in, in my uh, department here. So I think that might be a good excuse to reach out and say, no, let, let's take a look together and see if what they understand about invertebrates can, can inform us about what we think, you know, this vertebrate animal is doing. Very nice. Speaking of uh, specific invertebrates, we just got a question uh, on, on the profile of someone named Carrie, but the, this question asker specifies that Carrie is their mom and they are 11 years old. Their question is, the otter seems like it could crush clams. Was that part of its diet or was that not a thing yet? Well, are we talking about the, the fossil otter, the giant otter from Southeast Asia? Yes, I believe so. Yes. Uh, they, we, as far as we know, yes, we think they, they could have crushed and, and consumed clams. And that's how at least our uh, artist, Mauricio, has reconstructed this. So we, we do know that there are fossilized clams in the same site, same area where we find the bones of the giant otter. So that's, that's the best evidence we have. Uh, like, you know, our, in our discussion with Blank, no, we don't have that. The, the exact, you know, direct moment of truth where we, we see, you know, a clam or something lost in the, the jaw of the fossil otter. Uh, but there is in such close proximity, you know, we think that it could have consumed. And, and it's important to know that, you know, this giant otter was not a sea otter. You know, the, the coal mine is coastal, but it's still thought to be freshwater. So these are, would have been freshwater clams, not marine clams. Uh, part of that question uh, makes me think uh, so, so the, the question was, was that a thing yet? Which is a very interesting question. And so this is sort of a broader picture question outside the scope of your research, but how long have animals been crushing hard-shelled creatures? Like how, how far back do we see shell crushing adaptations like you're seeing in these jaws? Uh, that, that is a great question. And I think the first way I would try to find an answer to that or think about that question is think about you know, the relative sizes of the shells and relative sizes of the animals. So, so I, I'm more qualified to speak about the, the predators themselves than I am about the invertebrates. But from the carnivores that we know in the fossil record, many of them, especially you know, if you look before the Miocene, before 20, 22 million years ago, their sizes have not reached a point where you know, we start to see these very strong you know, appearing teeth and strong and, and, and thick jaws. So at least based on what we can tell from the jaws, there weren't many specialized uh, carnivores before the Miocene for anything in general. I think you know, that, that's our, our general understanding of the origins of carnivorans, which is the, the name for the group. You know, they probably didn't start, ironically, as true carnivores. You know, they didn't all eat just meat. They probably were getting by much like foxes today would do or smaller weasels would do, uh, you know, hunting whatever they could and maybe supplementing it with other you know, invertebrates or, or non-animal material. Uh, but in terms of predation on shells, that actually stretches much further back and, and we're sort of going beyond shell crushing. So even before animals were large enough to crush these, there were other predators that are invertebrates that were drilling through the shells of some of these animals and eating them through those drilled shells. So you, you didn't have to, you know, there's more than one way to eat a clam, right? You can crush it with brute force. It might be more fun, but you can also drill if you're a much smaller animal, drill through the shell of your prey and then sort of suck the prey out <laughs> through that hole that you've created. And, and invertebrate paleontologists find records of you know, shell predation, drilling much further back. I don't know how much back, but, but definitely, you know, Mesozoic, if not Paleozoic. Yeah, I would say, you know, even back in the early Paleozoic, you're going to start seeing it in, in developing shells in the first place is, is sort of a protection against being preyed upon. And then you're going to start developing the predators that can prey on those that have shells. And so, you know, since, since you have the shell, then you're going to start having those predators as well. Well, David, we should probably uh, wrap it up. We're at about an hour. Yep, that seems about right. Um, I will just mention that in reference to uh, the earlier conversation about the types of invertebrates, uh, Alton Dooley, our friend Alton Dooley has uh, 
chimed in to comment that your mollusk slide shows a mix of hard bottom attached species like oysters and soft substrate burrowers like tusk shells and razor clams. So it seems like uh, there would have been a variety of options for these animals at the time. I also awesome. got a text from Larissa DeSantis who said that she would be happy to start looking at the microware. So you already have another research project and volunteer there. <laughs> awesome, yeah. Oh, and Thanks, I should Larissa. mention that uh, uh, Grant, when, when Grant asked the question about isotope work, uh, he also said, I'm intrigued and would love to break into doing isotope work with carnivorans. So All you've right. got some, <laughs> you got some takers. <laughs> All right. So let's build a dream team. Let's, let's get this going. <laughs> yeah. And so if there are any other questions that come in on Facebook, either us or Jack, we'll, we'll try and answer those. But thanks everybody for chiming in. And thanks again, Jack. That was really interesting. Thank you. Thank you so much. And thanks for all the great questions. No, this was a lot, it was a lot of fun. Thanks. All right. Talk to you later. Thanks, everybody. Bye, everybody. Bye-bye.